afternoon theatre. We present Noel Johnson and Nicolette Bernard in The Jaconda Smile by Aldous Huxley, adapted for radio by Cynthia Pugh. The Jaconda Smile. A little more claret, Janet. Uh, just a drop. Yeah, here's Nurse. Well, did she eat her chicken? Just a few mouthfuls, that's all. It's one of our bad days, I'm afraid. And the noise these workmen are making in the house doesn't help your wife. My dear Nurse Braddock, dry rot in houses as in people must be eradicated at the source. Incidentally, Janet, the workmen are threatening to invade this part of the house next month, so I shall probably have to entertain in the shrubbery. <laughs> I must come over to your house one evening and have a game of chess with your father. he love it. Oh, that reminds me. We're in the most awful fix. Father's nurse has just told us she wants to leave to get married. I thought she had more sense than that. Well, you don't happen to know of anyone who could take her place, do you? Not for a paralysis case. We don't much care for paralysis cases as a rule. Oh. Uh, but I'll tell you what I'll do, Miss Spence. I'm going out this afternoon. I'll drop in and talk to the sister in charge. That's really very kind of you. Not at all. It's a real pleasure. Oh, and by the way, Mr Hutton, I hope you don't mind if I'm not back till late. Mrs Hutton said she didn't have any objection. So why ask me? Janet, I must show you my new picture after lunch. Another one? But Henry, aren't you ashamed of yourself? I simply couldn't resist it. An early Modigliani, one of those extraordinary nudes. I love disease. You must help me to decide where to hang it. You too, nurse. Don't hang it anywhere. That's my advice. Don't you like it, nurse? Like it? It makes me absolutely sick. From which, my dear Janet, you can infer that it must be pretty good. Only the very best modern paintings make nurse sick. The second-rate things don't cause anything worse than a touch of heartburn. Mrs. Hutton didn't like it either. In fact, she... She thought it was positively disgusting. I knew that without your telling me. Oh, that knocking. If you'll excuse me, Miss Spence, I'll go and take some dessert up to the poor invalid. You're not going to give her those red currants, are you? Why not? Well, remember what Dr. Libard said. Nothing with skins or pips. I believe in letting her have what she fancies. It does her more good than fussing around with diets and things. All right, have it your own way, but don't blame me if it upsets her. Only somebody would marry this one instead of yours. But that, I fear, is a lost cause. A poor thing. And yet Emily fairly dotes on the woman. So here she is, for life, poisoning every meal I eat. <laughs> There are two ways of being a martyr to ill health. The first way is to suffer from it. The second is to suffer from the sufferers. And I sometimes wish I could try the first way for a change. Why are you so cynical, Henry? Because I enjoy the pleasures of an easy conscience. Cynicism is simply confession without repentance. You admit your sins, and so you get rid of the unpleasant necessity of concealment and hypocrisy. But having confessed, you neither repent nor reform. You advertise your shortcomings, and you persist in them. What nonsense you talk. Everybody knows how patient and kind you've always been. In other words, what a very adequate income I've always had. You know how devoted I am to Emily. But even I have to admit, well, she doesn't make life too easy for the people around her, or for herself, if it comes to that. Yes, she's her own worst enemy, of course. But then who isn't? I often wonder what I'd do if I were ill and lonely and felt that nobody really cared for me. I think I'd commit suicide. One doesn't commit suicide because one has a reason for killing oneself. One does it because... <laughs> well, I've known lots of people whose life was obviously not worth living, and yet the idea of putting an end to it never even entered their heads. But, but, but if you knew that because of your life, other people's lives weren't worth living, wouldn't that make a difference? Not a bit of it. It would probably make you hold on even tighter, just to annoy your friends. Oh. Some people kill themselves out of spite and some refrain from killing themselves also out of spite. On the surface, the symptoms are slightly different, but at the bottom, it's always the same disease. Well, I hope that if ever I felt I was in the way, I'd have the courage to get rid of myself. It isn't a question of courage. It's just a matter of physiological reactions. If I couldn't do it myself, I'd ask someone else to do it for me. Ah, here's the coffee. Over here, please, Clara. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Black for you, isn't it, Janet? Well, let me do that, Henry. I'm, I'm very impatient to see the new picture. You are enthusiastic. All right, you deal with the coffee. I'll fetch it. It's, uh, it's in the study. Emily takes sugar, doesn't she? Yes, give her a lot. She likes something to take away the taste of her medicine. I put an extra lump in the saucer. Here it is. Oh, is this my coffee? No, that's Emily's. It's too sweet for you. Here's yours. Uh, oh, that picture... It's exquisite. 
I thought you'd like it. Oh, quite exquisite. Oh, how, how's your patient, nurse? Oh, as well as you can expect, all things considered. I'll take up the coffee at once, if you don't mind. I want to catch the 245 bus. Don't you bother, nurse. I'll take it. Uh, but there's her medicine, too. I'll give it to her. Drink your coffee. You've just got time. Well, that's very kind of you, I'm sure. And don't make yourself sick by looking at that picture. Oh, that poor Mrs. Hutton. Uh, what did you say? I feel so terribly sorry for her. Yes, with a heart in that condition, I suppose she might go at any moment. It isn't her health I'm thinking about. It's, well, you know. Miss Spence, I could tell you things that would make your hair stand on end. What sort of things? The sort of things you find out if you've been nursing for 23 years. When I think of that poor angel upstairs. When I first knew her, she was a beauty. Mm. Had her pictures in the papers and all that sort of thing. Then came her illness. Suddenly, there was nothing left to her. No parties, no theatres, no admirers. Nobody to court her and flatter her. Nobody even to listen to her. Isn't that typical of men? Sex. That's all they care about. Nothing but sex. He wouldn't do that. He's too loyal. You mean he knows which side his bread is buttered? Look at the money she's got. Oh, that's got nothing to do with it. He's, he's a rich man himself. The richer people are, the more they value money. That's what I've always found. And in any case, when a man's rich, he can get all the women he wants. No scandal, no divorce. Money. That's all. Does Mrs. Hutton suspect? I mean, does she think there's another woman? Oh, he's clever enough to keep things dark. But I tell you, we wouldn't be surprised at anything. Mrs. Hutton and you seem to have talked things over a great deal. Oh, now, dear, you mustn't feel jealous. There's nobody she cares for more than you. She's told me that again and again. But after all, you're not a registered nurse. You're not even married, dear. She'd feel embarrassed talking to you, whereas I'm like the doctor. You don't mind taking off your clothes for the doctor, do you? Well, that's how she feels about talking to me. And then, though I say it, it shouldn't, she likes me. She feels I'm a friend. I'll tell you something. Do you remember that brooch of hers, that diamond dragonfly? Yes. Well, she's going to leave me that in her will. Oh, I'm, I'm so glad. That means she cares for you. And poor Emily has so few people to care for. And so few who care for her, Miss Spence. Well, I must fly if I'm going to catch my bus. I'll go through the garden. Oh, good gracious. What's this tin doing on the veranda? Weed killer. Poison contains arsenic. Oh, imagine leaving this stuff where the dogs can get at it. I'll take it down to the shed. Goodbye, Miss Spence. Goodbye, nurse. Well, Janet, do you really like my picture? It's perfectly lovely. Uh, and to think he might still be alive and painting these things. I have no patience with these people who die young, all these Keatses and Shelleys and Schuberts. It's just idiotic. Make a note of it, Janet. You're invited to lunch on my 80th birthday. You're sure you won't be a bit bored with me by then? How do you mean? Well, look at this figure. Perfectly flat. And yet all the modelling's there. It's the line. If the line's good enough, it implies the volume. That's you, my mysterious Giaconda. Do you remember a young woman who came back from India? A very charming and beautiful young woman. Oh, that's neither here nor there. The point is that you showed her your pictures. You took the trouble to explain to her what they were all about. Ah, I begin to remember. But she never forgot. That's the difference. Do you know what you did for me, Henry? You opened a door, and there were all the things I'd only heard about. Painting, criticism, music. It was like a revelation. Like a conversion. And you didn't feel anything of what I felt. How could I? After all, I hadn't spent some of the best years of my life in an Indian garrison town. And to think that but for you and the grace of God, I might be there now. A colonel's lady, that's what I'd be by this time. And who knows? Perhaps you'd be very happy, my dear. Perhaps you made a great mistake when you turned down your nice young captain. Henry, how can you say that? After all, a man can have very bad taste in art and yet be a very good husband. And vice versa, I may add. But the one doesn't necessarily exclude the other. No. I've known people who could make the best of both worlds. 
such as a certain person who likes Modigliani. How strange that Emily never learned to care for painting. Oh, but she does. She cares a great deal. But her taste isn't very Catholic. She likes portraits, and only portraits of herself, and then only if they're flattering and by very expensive painters. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Uh, what is it, Clara? Mrs. Hutton says, would you please come upstairs a minute? Uh, tell her I'll come later on. She wants you to come now, sir. Oh, very well. Uh, sorry, Janet, I won't be long. Well, I'll have to be going in a moment anyhow. Uh, wait till I come back, please. Of course. Clara, is Mrs. Hutton feeling worse? Not that I know of, miss. Anyhow, worse or better doesn't make much difference. But it must be hard work for you with an invalid in the house. Oh, you get used to it, miss. You get used to anything. Until the moment comes when you say... That's enough. Well, a lot of good that does you. Because when you come down to it, one thing's just as bad as another. You can change your job as much as you like. There's always something wrong. So stay where you are. That's my advice. I wonder how long he'll be. Who's that? Oh. Oh, are you looking for somebody? Y yes, Mr. Hutton. Was he expecting you? Well, not exactly. But, but I mean, he knows who I am. Why didn't you ring at the front door? Oh, I, I came through the garden. It was shorter. I, I mean... Well, it was nothing, of course. Just fuss for fusses. Oh. <laughs> Miss Mead. What a pleasant surprise. Um, I don't think you know Miss Spence. Miss Mead is collecting subscriptions for the crippled children's homes. I've got the cheque ready for you, Miss Mead. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, the only thing is that I'd like to earmark the money for spastics. I couldn't quite make out what form I had to fill up. I'll say goodbye, Henry. No, no, I won't be a moment. Oh, but I've got to go. Thank Emily for me and tell her how sorry I am I couldn't see her. I will. Well, don't bother to see me out. Goodbye, Miss Mead. Goodbye. I'll ring up tomorrow and see what we can settle about that game of chess with your father. Yes, do that. Goodbye, Henry. You little idiot, Doris. Oh, darling. No, 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 none of that. I'm very angry with you. You know quite well you've got no business to come here. I know, darling, but I was passing the gate and I couldn't resist it. And you see what happened? It's lucky I had those papers lying there. You were wonderful, Teddy Bear. Crippled children. <laughs> well, that's nothing to giggle about. If you got the spanking you deserve, you'd be in a convalescent home. Oh. Go and sit down before anything worse happens to you. Goodness, what's that picture? Hmm. Rather nice, isn't it? But, Teddy Bear, the oh, curls aren't like that. I mean, you wouldn't like it if I... <laughs> <laughs> no, I certainly wouldn't. But fortunately, you are not a piece of canvas. <clears throat> I could eat you. Darling, do you love me? Like a cannibal. I know you don't really love me, but I don't care. I can love enough for two. What about having dinner with me tonight? Oh, that would be wonderful. Good. But now you've got to promise me something. Never come to this house again. It's pointless, it's idiotic, and it's dangerous. So you mustn't. All right, I promise. Tell me, is she in the house? Who do you mean? You know quite well who I mean. Is she still so ill? Well, let's talk about something else. I know, I'm not fit to mention her. Don't talk nonsense, it's simply a question of tact. Of good taste. In other words, you're ashamed. You don't want to be reminded of what you're doing. You just want to do it and not think about it. Exactly. That means you don't really care for me. I'm not ashamed. I wouldn't mind telling everybody. Because I love you. Because I feel this is the best thing I've ever done. You certainly don't feel that. No. One doesn't feel too proud of... Well, of being a seducer. Oh, I like that. Do you remember the first time you kissed me? Well, I'd made up my mind beforehand that I was going to make you kiss me. And I did make you. Well, I'm damned. So you see, you needn't feel so guilty. I won't talk about her. I know it makes you miserable. Besides, I'm dreadfully sorry for her, really. And for you, if it comes to that. Why for me? Because you can't be as happy as I am. The one who was here just now, was that Janet Spence? Yes. Oh, I'd never imagined she was like that. Not from the way you've talked about her. Why, she's as old as the hills. Well, of course, from your point of view, she's practically got one foot in the grave. To me, she looks like a very attractive girl of 35. She used to be really lovely ten years ago. And I suppose you flirted with her? Naturally. Do you still flirt with her? Only in the most spiritual way. We do a sort of Dante and Beatrice act. You know, soulmates. 
Now, what's the matter? Sometimes I really hate you. Oh, don't be silly. Can't you understand the joke? It isn't a joke. You do care for her. I don't care for her. I just care for the things she cares about. She's the only person in this godforsaken neighbourhood who isn't a barbarian or a philistine. What about a little drive this afternoon? Mm, that'll be lovely. All right. I'll go and get my things and tell them I shan't be in this evening. What will you say you're doing? Oh, I'll say... I'll tell them I'm dining with old Mr. Johnson to discuss the war memorial. Oh, Teddy Bear. At present rate of progress, it'll be ready just in time for the next little massacre to end all massacres. Or even the next but one. That is, if there's anything left of us by then. Meanwhile, my pet, the grave's a fine and private place. But none, I think, do their embrace. From which I can draw only one conclusion. What's that? Don't waste time talking. Run along and wait in the car. I shan't be long. All right, Teddy Bear. By Dr. Lebard. Now, what are you doing here? Is my wife ill? Hutton, I've been waiting for you for four hours. The servants tried to reach you at Mr. Johnson's, but they had no news of you there. No, I was detained. I, um... I had a breakdown. Your wife kept asking to see you. Oh, I'll go up to her at once. I'm afraid it's too late. Too late? Oh, yes, it is a quarter to twelve. I suppose she's asleep. Hutton, your wife had a heart attack about four hours ago. Dead? Yes. Unfortunately, I was out when they called me. I didn't get here until it was all over. It was the nurse's day out, too. The only person who was with her, except for the maids, was Janet. Uh, they sent for Janet, did they? I think her presence must have been a great comfort to poor Emily. It's a great help to be able to hold somebody's hand, to feel you're not completely abandoned. It's strange. She hadn't been complaining of her heart these last days. It came on suddenly. There was a violent attack of nausea in the afternoon, and that was the thing that knocked out the heart. I understand from the maid she'd eaten some red currants at lunch. Do you mean to say that that could have killed her? Indirectly, yes. When a heart's in the condition hers was in, you can't risk the smallest indiscretion. Oh, excuse me. I saw a light in here, and I wondered... Oh, Dr. Libard, is anything wrong? Nothing. Except that you've managed to kill your patient. What do you mean? Mrs. Hutton died of heart failure while you were out. And it was because oh. you let her have those currants. Do you remember? Is this true, nurse? Oh, but uh, she liked... Them, so. You know how strongly I've always insisted on a bland diet. I, I didn't think that a few currants. Well, that's enough, be... nurse. <laughs> you went against my instructions. You were absolutely in the wrong. Admit it. <laughs> I warned you at the time, but you insisted on taking them to her. You wanted to have your own way, didn't you? Admit it. Admit it. Please, Hutton. <laughs> this is a professional matter. Henry. She looks so calm now. So beautiful. You feel she's come home at last, come home and gone to sleep. I think I'll go up to her room. <laughs> I know it must have come as a terrible shock to you, nurse. You were so devoted to her. <laughs> Dr. Libard says it was my fault. Her fault, Doctor? I gave certain instructions. Nurse Braddock chose to ignore them. Whether this was actually responsible for what happened tonight, I can't say. Currants are the last thing I'd have allowed Mrs. Hutton to eat. You think it was the currants? She didn't eat anything else that could have upset her like this. <laughs> you better go to bed, nurse. You can't do anything for anyone. <laughs> what are you going to do about this, Dr. Libard? I suppose I ought to report her to her organization. The odd thing is that she's really a first-rate nurse. I don't understand it. I think I know why she did it. I suppose she cared too much for her patient, thought she was doing the poor woman a favour. Yes, she really loved Emily. But that's only part of the explanation. The other part is that she wanted to spite Henry. Why? She didn't like him, that's all. Just because he belongs to the male sex, I suppose. Mm, some of them get like that. Henry was always very keen on Emily sticking to her diet. That was enough to make Nurse Braddock ridicule the whole thing. With the result that she kills the person she's most attached to. Oh, oh dear. She must be feeling the shock more than any of us. I'd like to help her if it's possible. You know my father's nurse is leaving us. Mm, my poor Janet. I was thinking I'd ask Nurse Braddock to come and take her place. That is, well, if you feel she'd be all right. Well, as I've said, she's an uncommonly good nurse. And I don't think there'd be any psychological difficulties with them. No, I think she likes me quite well. All right. I won't say anything on condition she goes to you. 
I'll still be in touch with her in that case. I think you're very generous. Mm, one tries to use a little discrimination, that's all. Should I go and talk to her, do you think? Do. The poor woman was obviously in an awful state. I'll wait here for Hutton. Very well. Oh, here he is. I'm going up to see Nurse, Henry. Very well, Janet. Well, there's nothing to say, of course. Just a lot of platitudes that don't signify anything. Have a drink, Libard? No, thanks. One talks in one universe, one dies, and one suffers in another. I found that out when Margaret died. You two were very close, weren't you? We've been married nearly 30 years. 30 years. And yet it isn't the time that counts. It's what you feel and what you are. Do you remember Emily as she was in this photograph? Hmm. Margaret used to say she was uh, like the princess in a fairy story. To my darling, wilt thou sail with me? Shelley? Yes. He wrote it to an Emily, too. We used to read it together. Uh -huh. Shall I tell you where I was this evening? Well, I don't think you need. It seems sufficiently obvious. I suppose you think I'm pretty contemptible, don't you? Oh, I don't think I have any right to pass that kind of judgment. Well, I do. That's what I am. That's what I've always been. Contemptible. I've never thought so. But I felt extremely sorry for you sometimes. Oh, contemptible. No goodness, no order, no sense or meaning. The model equivalent of a slum. That's what my life has been, and in an obscure kind of way, I've always known it. But I wouldn't face the fact. You had nothing to make you face the fact. Perhaps not. But I was capable of being, I won't say a better man, because that's claiming too much, but I was capable of achieving, achieving something. Being born with a lot of money as you were, it's no joke. Heaven knows it's dreary enough to earn one's own living, but at least it gives a certain purpose and direction to one's existence. Do you think I'm capable of changing? Well, of course, if you want to. I do want to. At this moment, yes. But it's so easy to be heroic in time of crisis. Will you feel the same a month from now? Do you think I'm as weak as all that? Wouldn't surprise me if you were. Wouldn't surprise me if you weren't. <laughs> At my age, I've stopped being surprised at anything. Uh, what are you doing? I've got to write a note. Excuse me a moment. The moon's almost full, I see. What I hated most when I worked in London was never seeing the sky... Only a lot of smoke with whiskey advertisements. That's what makes modern man so idiotically bumptious. He lives in a horrible little homemade universe and thinks he's conquered the God-made one. He's industrialized himself to the point where he's in danger of exhausting all his natural resources. Oh, well, I must go. I've got a heavy day in front of me tomorrow. Drop this note in the letterbox as you go by, will you? Now, try not to forget. No, don't. It's important. Hmm? Miss Doris Mead. Can't believe that anyone called Doris can be as important as all that. Very important. To say goodbye to. Oh, I see. Well, then I certainly shan't forget. You're quite right. One doesn't know what one will be thinking and feeling a month from now, so let's do the irrevocable today. Then one can't change one's mind tomorrow. You're growing wise in your old age. Oh, well, Janet, what news? She's very grateful. Dr. Libard. And you'll have a new nurse, I hope. As soon as Henry will let her go. The sooner the better, as far as I'm concerned. Well, goodbye, Janet. Goodbye. Goodbye, Libard. And thank you for all you've done for me. Goodbye. I'll look in again tomorrow. I'm so thankful you were with poor Emily at the end. <laughs> did she... Did she suffer much? <laughs> oh, Janet. Don't let's talk about it anymore. It's been too much for you. It was terrible. It was so terrible. I'd, I'd never seen anybody die before. I, I didn't realize... Try to think of her only as she is now. She's at peace. The agony's over. You must think of that. I just can't keep the memory away. It's, it's like an obsession. I suddenly see her struggling for breath with... With that awful look of pain and fear in her face. Yes, but you must remember all those years of suffering and unhappiness. Now she's free. Yes. 
free. That is what we must remember. Hello? Oh, my London number. Thank you, operator. Hello. Piccadilly Palace. Have you got a double room for tonight? Yes, with a bath. The name is Hutton. Mr. and Mrs. Henry Hutton. Now, I don't expect to be in before 10.30. Thank you. Who's there? Well, Janet, come in. What a pleasant surprise. Well, I'm the one to be surprised. I thought you were in Cornwall. So did I, until this morning. I had to go to town unexpectedly, so I thought I'd take the opportunity to do a little burglary on the way. Without telling us you'd be here? My dear, it was all decided in such a hurry. Besides, I'm just driving through post-haste. How on earth did you know I was here? Oh, we decided to walk down to the village after dinner, and then suddenly I noticed a light in the house. So I let Father and Nurse Bradley go on and climbed over the fence. More burglary. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm delighted. Sit down, won't you? May I? I won't stay long. Only till the others get back from the village. I hope they won't get caught in the rain. It looked pretty menacing just now. I'm glad you came, Janet. It'll save me writing a letter and going to the post office. This is for you. Oh, well, what is it? Well, open it and see. But... But, Henry, it's, it's Emily's bracelet. And Emily would want you to wear it. Me? Well, I don't know anyone who has as much right to it as you do. Her best friend, the person who did more for her than any other. Let me put it down for you. There. Henry, I, I couldn't. I, I don't deserve it. But, Janet, she loved you. She'd want you to have something that would always remind you of her. And you were very fond of her, weren't you? No, no, Henry, I can't. Take it off, please. Oh, Janet, I should be offended if you won't take it. Oh, do you want me to have it? Of course I want you to have it. I just felt it was too much. Too much? <laughs> Not nearly enough. Oh, it's really very beautiful. Do you mind if I finish packing up these papers while we talk? Of course not. Did you hear that? Look, it's as black as pitch outside. How much longer are you going to be away, Henry? Well, I really can't say. I suppose you'll be back in two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. Thereabouts. Perhaps a little longer. Various things have turned up recently. I, I may have to be in town for a bit. What about your father and the nurse? They're going to get awfully wet, aren't they? Oh, they'll take shelter somewhere. I love thunderstorms, don't you? Frankly, I don't. I once saw a man killed by lightning just a few feet away from me. Look at the trees. Writhing, struggling. As if they were trying to get free, but they can't. They're tied down. The wind blows through them. And all it can do is to torture them. Tear them to pieces. Destroy them. Here's the rain. What a release. Release. It's like somebody who's had to keep everything locked up inside herself, and then suddenly she can let go. You must know what that's like, Henry. Know what what's like? Having to hide the thing that's most important to you, being forced to live a lie, against your will, against all your feelings. This is getting too close for my liking. You can't be happy if you're living a lie. Can't you? I don't know. But how could you be under those conditions? And after all... Well, everyone's got a right to happiness. A right? Now, why should it be a right? I don't claim anything by right. I just take what happens to come my way and thank my lucky stars. Poor Henry. You haven't had much happiness in your life, have you? Oh, golly, how I hate this. <laughs> You're quite right. I'm far from happy at this moment. You can make a joke of it, but I know what you've been through, Henry. The isolation, the spiritual loneliness. I've known what that can be. There's nobody to understand or sympathize. Nobody you can talk to about your most precious thoughts and feelings. Yes, your poor father. It must have been pretty difficult sometimes. Yes. So, you see, I realize what you've had to go through. Emily was so sweet and kind and with that touching, childlike quality. 
But she was no companion for a man like you. She could never share in your tastes and interests. She could only... Hello. It's right overhead. It's wonderful. It's like... It's like passion. Now, Janet, you've been reading too many novels. Passion, passion. Oh, but you know what I mean. Loving so much or hating so much that at last it breaks out in spite of yourself like lightning, like a thunderbolt, like the wind and the rain. And woe to the man who hasn't got an umbrella. Henry, we're free now. We needn't pretend any longer. Pretend? What? I tried to hide it, but you must always have known, Henry. Just as I always knew about you. About me? Oh, yes, of course. I knew what you felt. And I knew you'd never admit it out of a sense of honour and duty. And now there's no need for acting. It's been so long, Henry. And I cared so much. But, Janet, listen to me. It's impossible. But, Henry, you've forgotten. We can do what we want now. There's nothing to prevent it anymore. We don't have to think of anyone but ourselves. Janet, there's something you don't understand. I'm, I'm sorry, Henry. Well, my dear, don't let's say anything more about it. You're overwrought. It's the thunder. I ought to have known how you'd feel about it. It's still too recent, too painful. Poor Emily. Emily? That face. I thought I'd put it out of my mind. So frightened, so horribly frightened. And I talked about us. No wonder it upset you. The storm seems to be moving away. It isn't raining quite so hard. Do you think we ought to take the car and see if we can rescue your father? Henry, this won't make any difference later on, will it? In what way? Well, when the pain has worn off, when we can think of ourselves again. De oh, I, I see what you mean. Um, listen, Janet, I, I, I think I ought to tell you. While I was away in Cornwall... What happened while you were in Cornwall? Well, to cut a long story short, I got married... You got married? It's someone you don't know. As a matter of fact, I've only known her for a few months. I'm sure you'll like her when you meet her. Of course, she is rather young, only about 22, as a matter of fact. Quite a baby. 22? So, you see, she has plenty of time to learn, and oh, she'll adapt herself soon enough. Young people seem to be so sensible nowadays, so much on the spot, very different from what we were at their age. <laughs> well, what are you laughing at? Oh, um, nothing in particular. <laughs> oh, we're still friends, aren't we? Of course we are. Better than ever. And how we shall chuckle over this and we can look back on it. The little joke you played on me and the little joke I played on you. The joke? Why, of course. Oh, you didn't think I was serious, did you? <laughs> no. No, naturally I didn't. And when shall I have the pleasure of meeting your sweet little... Oh, by the way, what's her name? Doris. Oh, your sweet little Doris. When are you going to inaugurate her? Oh, what's that? Jerry, are you there? Oh, it's father. Father, are you soaked? Wheel him in, nurse. Good evening, General. Good evening, Hutton. Well, this is like campaigning in the monsoon. You're right, sir. Sorry to load ourselves on you. Livard came by while we were sheltering and insisted on our coming here. Pushed me half the way in this hearse. Well, why didn't he come in? Went back for his car. Oh, here he is. Oh, do please excuse this intrusion, Hutton. Oh, don't mention it. As a matter of fact, we were just coming out to look for the general. A lot of fuss. Don't call that a storm, do you? Well, the same. You've got rather wet, general. I suggest you get yourself rubbed down with a dry towel. Would you mind, Hutton? Of course not. Nurse, you know where the towels are kept. Take whatever you need. Thank you. I will. Oh, where the devil are you taking me? I, 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 I don't want to. I'm not a towel. Have a drink, Libard. Thank you. Guess what Henry has brought back from Cornwall, Dr. Libard? Well, what does one bring back from Cornwall? I seem to remember um, paperweights made of malachite. Oh, no, serpentine. Isn't that the stuff? It isn't a paperweight. It's alive. Alive? Well, thank you. <clears throat> well, one used to be able to get the most wonderful palettes at Falmouth. Uh, brought back by those sailors. And what a vocabulary. Is it one of those? It's a mammal. Janet. Well, isn't it? A mammal? Oh, well, it's a dog, a pony, a badger. Oh, I give it up. A Siamese cat. A wife. <clears throat> I'd better go and see to father. Well, I, I suppose I ought to congratulate you, Hutton. Thank you. And yet I posted that letter you gave me most faithfully. It wasn't quite as irrevocable as you thought? No. It wasn't. 
Do you remember in the Gospels all those people possessed by devils? Nobody believes in that sort of thing nowadays, and yet isn't it the most plausible explanation of some of the things we do? No, well, that's one way of disclaiming responsibility. Oh, but there's also such a thing as uh, free will. Yes, there's such a thing as free will. And you can use your will to get rid of your will. And you can use your will to invite the devils to take possession. And the devils make you do things that are idiotic and suicidal. In spite of which, you go on. In spite of which, and also because of which. After all, idiocy is a way of getting out of oneself. So suicide... Not that I'd care to blow my brains out, but social suicide. There's something very fascinating about the idea of being ostracized, being cut off from the group you've always belonged to. And that's why you married? To be ostracized. There were also other reasons, too. A uh, child? That's one of the reasons. <laughs> that's the best news you've ever given me. We'll make a human being of you, even yet. Better not mention this to Janet. Not yet a while. Oh, of course not. Uh, though she'll find out soon enough, of course. Not as soon as all that. Doris and I are going abroad in a couple of days. I'd meant to do it without letting anyone know, but then this happened, and, well, I, I felt I had to tell Janet about our marriage. Otherwise, I'd have kept it quiet for a few months. It would have made things easier. However, everything doubtless is for the best and the best of all possible worlds. Excuse me. Hello? Oh, it's you. Father's in need of a drink. Do you mind if I get him one? Uh, uh, no, no, help yourself, Janet. You'll find glasses in the cupboard. Thank you. No, stay where you are. I'll come and fetch you in the car. Yeah, that was my wife. She went to see some friends, and now the roads are like rivers. Can I take you along, Libard? No, no, thanks. I've got my car outside. Take this to Father, will you, nurse? Thank you, Mr. Best. I'll be back in a few minutes, Janet. Then I'll run you over to your house. Thank you, Henry. And meanwhile, I'll have a chance of meeting your little daughter. Doris. Of course. I, uh, I shan't be long. Well, I must be off, too. I'll be looking in to see your father one day early next week. All right. Good night. Good night. How's father, nurse? He's tired. He's going to have a nap. I'm glad it's good for him to sleep. It's not my place to say anything. But if you ask me, I think it's disgusting getting married six weeks after that poor angel breathed our last... Six weeks. Shameful, that's what it is. Oh, don't take it too seriously. A girl young enough to be his daughter. It makes me absolutely sick to think of it. He told me he'd known her several months. Oh. That means that even while Emily was alive... Didn't I tell you so? You wouldn't believe me. But you see, pigs, that's what men are. Every one of them. I don't know how they dare. I'd be so nervous of being caught. You would, yes. But men have no shame. No decent feelings. All the same, it must have come as a great relief to him. You mean when she died? Well, he wanted to marry the girl. How do we know he didn't have to marry her? You mean she was... I'd be ready to bet on it. He gets her in trouble and then he has to get her out again. And if Emily hadn't died just when she did... Well, luckily for them, she did die just at the right moment. Just at the right moment. Miss Spence. You don't suppose... Suppose what? Why wouldn't he let me take the medicine up to her? He'd never done that before. He knew you were in a hurry. I thought it was very nice of him. He never did anything nice for me. No, Miss Spence. He took that medicine up to her because he'd got some reason for it. You're not suggesting that... Well, that he put something into it. Oh, that's too absurd. That tin of weed killer. What tin? Don't you remember? Standing there in the veranda... It was printed on the label, poison, contains arsenic. What are you talking about? Arsenic, arsenic brings on vomiting. So that was why he made all the fuss about the red currants. Just to give himself an alibi. But you're mad, it's absolutely ridiculous. You thought it was ridiculous when I told you he was carrying on with a girl. Well, who was right, you or me? And another thing. Why did it happen on the day I was out? What difference did that make? Why, if I'd been there, he'd never been able to get away with it. I'd have recognised the symptoms immediately. So what does he do? Chooses a day when he knows I won't be back till late. Till it's all over, in fact. And when he gets home, he turns on me and says I killed her with the red currants. But after all, Dr Libard thought it was the currants. Yes, and why? Because the other one keeps harping on it, and so I have to take the blame. Well, I'm not going to put up with it any longer. And it's not merely a question of my own interests. 
It's a matter of principle. I want to see justice done. I want to have the whole world know the truth. You talk as though you knew it yourself. Well, I do. I'm as certain about it now as I would be if they'd already had the autopsy. The autopsy? Yes, the autopsy. Do you mean to talk to Dr. Libard? Dr. Libard? No, of course not. He wouldn't want to admit he'd made a mistake, would he? He tried to talk me out of it. No. I've got my contacts. I know who to go to. And suppose they did find something in the body. They'll ask who put it there. And when they ask that, they'll find there's only one possible answer. Only one answer? Come along in, darling. Yes. And here it is. Janet, my dear. This is Doris. As a matter of fact, you've seen her before. Do you remember? Oh, the crippled children. <laughs> that was a good joke, wasn't it? Oh, yes. This is Nurse Braddock, General Spencer's nurse. How do you do, Mrs. Hutton? I'll, uh, I'll get the cases done. Do you mind if I call you Doris? You know, it seems ridiculous for me to be calling you Mrs. Hatton. I love it. And you must call me Janet. Yes, Miss Spence. I mean Janet. My dear, what a lovely brooch. Don't I recognize it? Yes, it belonged to Mrs. Hatton. I, I mean, you know. Of course. Emily's diamond dragonfly. Do you see, Nurse? I'd noticed it already. I remember how much you admired it. Nurse Braddock used to be a great friend of poor Emily's before she before she came to help me with my father. She was really more of a friend than a nurse. It isn't friendship that gets you diamond brooches. But it gets you diamond bracelets, all right. Look, Doris, see what your husband has just given me. Oh, he gave you that? This afternoon. Wasn't that sweet of him? Oh. Aren't you a little jealous, Doris? Oh, of course not. You're a real flatterer, aren't you? Tell me, Doris, are you very, very happy? Yes, I... I think so. Well, you only think so. Oh, no, no, I don't mean that. Nurse! Nurse, where are you? Uh, excuse me, Miss Spence. I'm coming, General. I'm sorry. Let, let's talk about something else if it upsets you. Oh, but I am happy, really and truly. It's just... Well, you know, I'm not very clever, and Henry seems to know everything. I'd like to have some lessons or something, you know, about art and things. You sweet child. Then I'd know the difference between things. I mean, some pictures look funny, but they aren't meant to be. You have to know which is which, don't you? It's advisable. You heard this, Janet? About Hutton getting married again? Yes, Father, I knew. More sensible fellow than I thought. And here is Mrs. Hutton. Oh. Isn't she enchanting? Doris, dear, my father, General Spence. How do you do? Take that ridiculous hat off. Oh. That's better. She is the image of your mother when we were engaged. Same hair, same eyes. But I'd say the nose was a tiny bit more obtrusive. Turn your head. Yes. yes, definitely. Do you remember, Janet, that photograph of her in the riding habit? Yes, I do. That's the thing she was wearing when I saw her first. Dark green, and she was riding a grey gelding. Don't you ever ride in anything but a habit, my dear. No britches. No. Women of the right shape for britches. Whereas in a riding habit, well, a man could still have illusions. And what's life without illusions? Nasty, brutish, and short. And women's legs are shorter than life. Ah, Hutton, do you hear that? No breeches. If my wife had worn breeches, I'd never have married her. And Janet would have remained a twinkle in your eye. Yes, well, it's about time she became a twinkle in somebody else's eye. Don't you agree, Hutton? No, no, don't get so excited. I will get excited if I choose. It's about time she thought of herself for a change. Time she stopped this damned self-sacrifice. Tell her to let me go to blazes and find herself a husband. Have you anyone in mind, Father? Or you, Henry, have you any suggestions? Oh, that's up to you, my girl. When a girl sets a cap at a man, she usually gets what she wants in the long run. We don't want you to end your days as one of those damned spinsters. Now, this little filly knew what she was about. You're a wise and lucky young woman. Yes, I'm lucky. Are you? What exactly do you mean by that, nurse? I'm going to get in touch with the authorities. I've something to say of interest to the coroner. Hello? Yes, this is Mrs. Hutton. Who? Oh, it's you, Aunt Nellie. What? This is an awful line. 
Oh, the inquest. You thought I'd be there? Oh, no, Henry didn't want me to go. Besides, I've still got a bit of a cold. He isn't back yet. I don't think it'll be over for another hour or so. But, Auntie, there isn't any doubt about it. Of course it'll be all right. Why an inquest? Just out of spite, nothing else. They're angry because we didn't wait a year. And then they're all a hundred years old, so they simply hate me. No, she's all right. She's been awfully nice, really. And her father likes me, too. He's sweet. It's only me. Come in, Janet. I shan't be a moment. Listen, Auntie. I've got to ring off now. Janet's just come in for tea. I'll call you back later. Goodbye. Well, well. Sitting there with all her toys around her like a dear little girl. Janet, you don't look well. What's the matter? I'm perfectly all right. Are you still sleeping so badly? Oh, that's nothing. And anyhow, Dr. Libard's promised to give me some kind of pill. From now on, I shall snore. You've been worrying too much, Janet. Well, is that surprising? After all, Henry's a very old friend. Oh, I won't worry. I know everything's going to be all right. Excuse me, madam. There's tea. That'll be all. Thank you, Clara. Very good, madam. Henry ought to be back pretty soon. How was he when he went off this morning? A bit worried, I suppose. No, he was too angry to be worried. It makes him so furious, the way they're treating him. As though he were a member of the unprivileged classes. <laughs> Darling, how dreadfully unkind of me. I quite forgot to ask how you've been. Is everything going as it ought to go? Well, I still feel sick in the morning, if that's what you mean. And Dr. Libard's pleased with you, is he? He seems to be. It must be a very strange and wonderful thing. You mean to be going to have a baby? Yes. Oh, I suppose it'll be all right when the baby's actually there. But now I think I'd rather have the measles again. At least it doesn't last so long. <laughs> yes, Clara? Nurse Braddock would like to speak to you, madam. Ask her to come in. What can she want? Can't think. Good afternoon, nurse. Good afternoon, Mrs. Hutton. I hope you won't mind my bursting in like this. I realise quite well what you must be thinking of me. But in view of what's happened, I feel I was fully justified in doing my duty. What do you mean, in view of what's happened? I've just left Dr. Libard. He'd come straight from the inquest. The man from the home office gave his evidence. They found arsenic in the body. But th that's a poison. It's got hardly any taste. That's why so many murderers use it. I think you'd better go, nurse. Why does everyone turn on me? I was only trying to help. I thought I ought to warn this poor child of the danger she was running. Please go. Dr. Libard asked me to give you this, Miss Spence. It's your sleeping pills. Thank you. Well, don't say I didn't warn you. What will they know now, Janet? Well, dear, the coroner's jury will have to decide how the poison came to be where it was. And then, if somebody is suspected, there'd have to be a trial. Janet, do you think... I mean... Could they do something to him? To Henry? But Henry hasn't done anything. No, but suppose he had. Doris, you mustn't say those things. But just suppose. Then they could do something, couldn't they? Well, you know what happens to people who... who kill someone. Oh, it's too awful. Oh, darling, don't cry. It'll be all right. No, please. Yeah. Take this, dear. I don't want anything. It's what Dr. Libart's given me for sleeping. One tablet, just enough to calm your nerves a little, that's all. Thank you, Janet. You've been an angel. You'll feel quieter in a moment, dear. Janet, isn't there anything he can do? Well, he's doing it. He's answering their questions. He's explaining why it couldn't be him. But if he can't explain, couldn't he go somewhere and hide? I suppose he could if he went far enough. I, I, I must get back to my father. He gets so impatient if I'm late for his game of chess. Bye, darling. Bye. And don't fret. You'll see. Tomorrow it'll all be explained. Oh, dear. Where could we go, I wonder? What's the number? Here, here it is. Hello? I want Roman Way 23. Good afternoon. I want to ask about booking seats on a plane. Yes, I'll hold on. Oh, hello. If I wanted to book two seats on a plane, could I do it at the last moment? Where to? 
Oh, Italy. Yes, Rome, that's right. And you think there might be a chance of getting seats even if I made up my mind by tonight? What time does it leave? Thank you, I'm much obliged. Hello, darling. Are you feeling all right? Yes. I just heard what happened. It's too terrible, isn't it? It's terrible because it's impossible. And yet it's happened. But how? Oh, don't ask any questions, darling. Don't let's talk about it. Not now. It's all a confusion. Like a dust storm. No worse than that. Like being in the middle of a swarm of insects. I just can't think about it anymore. Kiss me, darling. And we know. Oh, darling. This is impossible, too. Impossibly good for a change. And yet it happens. It's happening now. How does a piece of matter set about falling in love or writing Hamlet? It's just out of the question. And yet there Hamlet is. And there are you. And here am I. Defying time outside this nightmare of perpetual perishing. Beyond evil, beyond good. Darling, I never knew you loved me as much as that. Hmm. As much as what? As much as this? Or as, as this? Or as this? Why did you do it, Henry? Why did you do it? Why did I do it? You all seem to take it for granted that I murdered my wife. First as the coroner, did I put anything to Emily's medicine? Then old Johnson cuts me dead in the street outside the court, and now you. You. I suppose you imagined I was so insanely in love that I'd do anything to get you, anything, anything. It's about time women realize that men don't go insane about them. All one asks for is a little amusement and a chance to forget oneself. Please, Henry, don't. I don't know why the devil I ever married you. Why any man in his right mind ever married any woman, for that matter. I've had enough. Henry! He's gone. He's left me. Oh, I can't go on. I can't. Janet's sleeping pills. Take the lot. Well, that's that, young woman. A day in bed and you can do what you like. And remember... No more of this sort of nonsense, swallowing half a bottle of sleeping tablets. I'm sorry, Dr. Libard. I won't do it again. Good girl. No, I'm not good. I've done dreadful things. That's why all this is happening. You heard what they said at the inquest. Do you think... I, I mean, is it possible? No, I feel sure it wasn't, Henry, if that's what you mean. Oh, I'm so thankful. But then who... How did it happen? It might very easily have been suicide. Do you really think so? Well, you tried it, didn't you? I like Henry. But I confess I'm glad I'm not married to him. Well, that isn't fair, Dr. Lippard. It was my fault, not Henry's. After all, why should he love me if he doesn't want to? It's my business to love him. Tell me how I can help him. Well, first of all, you've got to believe in him, in spite of everything. And then whatever happens... You've got to be strong and calm. And finally, remember, you're going to have a baby. That'll probably be about the best thing that ever happened to Henry. So for goodness sake, don't let's make a mess of it. Here he is now, remember. Is it all right if I come in now, Libard? I've been waiting for hours. Is she all right? Flourishing. Hello, darling. Hello. I'm so thankful you got here in time, Libard. If it's any comfort to you... I don't draw the obvious conclusions from the medical evidence. Good night, Henry. Thank you. Good night. I'm sorry, darling. Oh, I'm the one who's sorry. I was just trying to spite you, trying to get my own back. I began it, I'm afraid. But I ought to have known better. At 22. This is something where it doesn't make any difference how old you are. It's just a question of well, being a girl. Oh, no, I hate that word. It's all wrong. Why can't women call themselves women? Why do they have to pretend they're like all those faces in the movies? You know, always looking at men out of the corner of their eyes. 
can't do it myself, of course. Why? I don't know. But of course it isn't any different. I love you just as much in that way. Only now there's something else. Do you know what I mean? Yes. I know what you mean. And to think I... I try to kill myself. And everything's so beautiful. So mysterious. Darling, let's call him Patrick. Well, I'm not an Irishman, but I don't have any objection to Patrick. And if it's a girl? Well, what about Belinda? No. There I draw the line. <laughs> All right, then. We'll call her something else. Oh, it's going to be so wonderful. They'll go to school, and they'll grow up, and they'll marry, and then I'll be grandchildren. Meanwhile, there'll have been two or three more world wars and half a dozen slumps and revolutions, but fortunately, private life will still go on. Henry, we've forgotten. We're just shutting our eyes and pretending. Listen, just before you came back from the court, I rang up the airport. They say that with luck, you can get seats at the last moment. I'm well enough. I could get up now if I had to. Who put this idiotic idea into your head? You don't think it's a good plan? Excellent, if you want to get me tried for murder. Can't you see? It'll be simply asking them to arrest me. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Of course not, because you still believe I did it. Oh, but I do. Then why do you suggest that I should run away? Oh, I thought it would be safer. In case you couldn't make them believe. Oh, I've been a fool again. I've made you angry. It's only because I love you so much, because I was so terribly anxious. I said something very stupid this afternoon. I said I didn't know why I'd married you. Well, perhaps I didn't know then. But I do now. Why? Because I love my love with an L. Because she's so logical. So lamentable at the same time, and so lacrimose. Not to mention so light, so lithe, so lovely, and so ludicrous. <laughs> oh, darling. <laughs> Come in. It's Miss Spence, sir. She says she doesn't want to disturb you, but she forgot something when she was here this afternoon. Is it all right, darling? Yes. Ask her to come in, Clara. Very good, sir. What did she forget? Her sleeping pills. Oh. Well, in a certain sense, I'm glad she left them. Aren't you? <laughs> Hello, Janet. Darling, I've just heard from Clara. Oh, it's too awful. I'm quite all right, Janet, really. Is that true, Henry? Libard got here almost immediately. There's no harm done. Oh, thank God. I feel so guilty. If I'd been less absent-minded... Well, of course, it was a pretty dangerous operation, but it's turned out to be entirely successful. Hasn't it, darling? Yes. Oh. Well, I... I'd better take what's left of my property and go. Two's company, three's none. Goodbye, Doris. I know you'll be glad to get rid of me. No, I won't, Janet. You little fibber. Can I have a word with you, Henry? Certainly. I think I ought to tell you. I met the vicar just now, and then Colonel Brabazon joined us. He said the most terrible things about you. Well, I suppose it's only to be expected. I told them they had no right even to think that way, much less to talk. After all, it could have been an accident. It, it could have been suicide. Well, it certainly wasn't what they think. Poor Emily. She was always saying she was tired of life. I keep wondering if she hadn't heard something about... Yes. It's quite possible. Perhaps that was what drove her to it. Heavens, what one can do to people. Yes. What one can do to people. Well, good night, Henry. Good night, Janet. Good night. Come in, Doctor. Come in. I thought I'd just drop in to see how things were going. Father seems quite well. He's just gone out for his walk. And you? Hmm. Not much of a credit to your physician, I'm afraid. If I don't sleep tonight, I shall go mad. You've still got some of those pills I gave you, haven't you? They don't seem to work anymore. I get the most awful dreams and wake up again. Couldn't you give me something that would really make me sleep? I can't stand it any longer. Any fool can stop the symptoms of insomnia. The difficulty is to find the cause. To find it and then remove it. Well, it's going to be removed next Friday. Next Friday? Oh, I see. Do you hate him as much as all that? 
After all, it was proved, wasn't it? They proved that he killed Emily. How do you expect me not to hate him? Yet you used to be such good friends. Never. I always felt there was something wrong somewhere. Yet Emily thought that if she died, you and he ought to get married. Married? But that's monstrous. How can you say such a thing? Oh, only repeating what she said more than once, as I remember. Talking about me as though I were one of those women of his, as though I were the kind of slut that will tumble into bed with any man that comes along. It's disgusting. It's... it's obscene. Oh, I don't know what's so obscene about marriage. I won't have it. Excuse me. Let me feel your pulse, will you? Oh. Mm. Getting excited doesn't help you to sleep, does it? I'm sorry, Dr. Libby. Don't apologize to me. Apologize to yourself. After all, you're the one who has insomnia. And I'll tell you of another who hasn't been sleeping properly. That's the one he actually did marry. Do you ever think of the child? Hutton's child? Yes. It's no joke to be the child of a criminal. No joke to be anybody's child. It's no joke to be born. But anyhow, I just can't believe that Hutton was responsible. Well, then, who was? Well, what about Emily herself? Emily? No, Emily wouldn't have committed suicide. She wasn't that sort of person. Yes, I must say, I was a bit surprised when you said that at the trial. She often talked to me about being tired of life, wanting to put an end to it all. I never heard her talk that way, never. Nor did Nurse Braddock, if I remember rightly. No, I don't know what she said, and I don't care. Hutton cared, all right. It carried a lot of weight with the jury. Somebody who'd been with Emily day and night for the best part of two years, and she says she's never heard so much as a whisper of suicide. And suicide was the main line of defense. I'm not interested in lines of defense. I'm interested in the truth. I'm interested in justice. If you're accusing me of telling lies just because I hated that beast, why do you let me go on like this? People don't like being stopped. So. I don't really mean it. It's just that I get worked up, and then it seems to go on by itself. Do you know that awful feeling? As though you were a violin and somebody was screwing up the strings tighter and tighter. Oh, God, I wish it were all over. All over? Hutton's going to be hanged. But don't imagine you're going to be free of him. In one way or another, this thing is going on. All you can do is to decide whether it shall go on in the worst possible way or in some other way. What other way? Ask yourself. All I know is that the way that's being followed now is the worst way. You can't sleep, and Hutton's going to be hanged for something he never did. But it was proved. Not to my satisfaction. It's nonsense to say it was suicide. Nurse Braddock never heard her say anything. I, I never heard her say anything. How could it have been? Very well. Let's assume you're right. I know I'm right. You know it wasn't Emily, and I know it wasn't Hutton. Well, then, it must have come through some other agency. I don't know what you're driving at. I'm driving at some way to make you sleep. Of course, you know the basic reason why poor Emily was so dreadfully unhappy. What was that? It was because she wouldn't accept the facts as she found them. She was an invalid and she'd lost her looks, but she wanted people to treat her as though she were young and pretty. Hence, all the misery. What has that got to do with me? Nothing. I'm just pointing out that people can come to terms with even the most terrible facts. I've known plenty of people who came to terms with death, even with pain, which is a good deal worse. Well, we've had a very interesting talk, Dr. Libard. Now, what about those sleeping tablets? Weren't you going to give me something a little stronger than you did last time? I'd like to try something else. Do you remember that young psychiatrist you met at my house last year, Dr. Fargen? Yes. I've known him ever since he was a boy. He can make you sleep if you want him to. Do you mean he'll hypnotize me? Send me to sleep and then make me say all sorts of things I don't want to say and I shan't know I've said them? No, no, I won't. I know what you're up to, you and your hypnotist, trying to drive me out of my mind so that you can have an excuse to lock me up. Listen, Janet, be reasonable. I'll kill you! All right. I'll write you out a prescription. Mrs. Hutton to see you, Miss. All right, show her in. Yes, Miss. Mrs. Hutton, Miss. Have you been all right, Mrs. Hutton? Yes, thank you. I... I hope you don't mind my coming, Janet. Not a bit. I'm delighted. You went to see him today, didn't you? Yes, I went this morning. Oh, Dr. Lippard, it was so terrible. 
His hands were all bleeding. Bleeding? From beating on the door. He wants them to let him talk to the governor of the prison, as if that would do any good. How can they do it? How can they kill a man who isn't guilty? You don't believe he's guilty, do you, Dr. Levin? You Levante? know I don't. Janet, I know you think he's guilty. They proved it, didn't they? They proved it, and yet I swear he didn't do it. I know he didn't. How do you expect me to go against the evidence? That's just what I came to talk to you about, Janet. You used to be his friend. You could still help him. Me? If you could just go and tell them it was a mistake. A mistake? What was a mistake? About her never saying that she wanted to kill herself. If you told them you hadn't really meant it... I did mean it. I never heard her talk that way, never. But if other people heard her, then it means that it's true. So it wouldn't be a lie. You could go and tell them that. After all, she did talk about it sometimes. They'd believe you, Janet. They'd do something. They might put it off, even now. Oh, Janet, please. Please. Don't kiss me. Pawing and slobbering like dogs, like monkeys, and then calling it love. Now he sends you to come and whine for mercy. Janet. That's it. Stand up for her. You'd like to do a little pawing and slobbering yourself, wouldn't you? And meanwhile, I'm to go and say I told a lie so that you can go on with your filthy lovemaking. Janet, how can you? You couldn't wait. You never even gave yourself a chance to find out what real love was like. Pawing and slobbering, that's all you cared about. So that you can mother the child of a criminal, the child of a man who's been hanged, because that's what he's going to be. Hanged. Hanged by the neck until he's dead. And now go. Go, go. Get out. In here, sir, please. Only five minutes, I'm afraid. I understand. I'm late, I know. Hutton, it's me. Ah. Oh, it's you, Libard. Help me, help me, for God's sake. I can only help you against yourself. What do you mean? I can prevent you from torturing yourself, that's all. But, Libard, it's only two days now. Less than two days, only a little more than 40 hours. 40 hours! Well, that's time enough to be reconciled. Time enough to come to terms with the facts. Oh, that clock. Yes, the hands move forward. Well, is that any reason for turning the last two days of your life into a hell of fear and bitterness and resentment? You've seen a lot of people die, haven't you? A great many. It, it, is, it, is it very bad? Only for the people who won't accept what's happening to them. It's a question of accepting what can't be avoided or escaped. And not only accepting it, actually willing it. This is the inevitable. This is my destiny. And I will that it shall be exactly as it is. And when you say that, the inevitable comes the tolerable and even, in a certain sense, the reasonable. Reasonable? Libard, I didn't do it. Do you believe me? I believe you. And you still think that what's happened is reasonable? Not by our everyday standards. But when the thing can be accepted and willed... Do you accept it and will it? No, of course not. But a wrong that's inflicted on me, an evil that I suffer, those I can accept. And if I do accept them, if I go further and actually will them, then the wrong and the evil change their nature. Uh, uh, of course, in a way, all this isn't entirely unjust. I, I didn't kill Emily, but I certainly tortured her because I wasn't prepared to forego my amusements. Oh, it's terrible what monstrous things one's ready to do just to amuse oneself. It all seemed so trivial and excusable at the time. But no, now I know better. And it's too late. It's never too late to recognize the truth. Do you think we all get what we deserve. What else do we get? God is not mocked as a man sows, so shall he reap. And yet I don't believe I'm any worse than plenty of other men I know. And what are they doing at this moment? Shooting pheasants or telephoning to their stockbrokers or, or dozing in an armchair at the club? Shooting pheasants and telephoning to one stockbroker aren't necessarily the rewards of virtue. On the contrary, they may be punishments. After all, a man who spends his time on that sort of thing isn't spending it on anything else. Which means that he's some sort of a spiritual abortion. But to grow a fully developed human being 
is always much more rewarding, however painful the process of growth may be. And yet, if you do accept the responsibilities, there's an extraordinary satisfaction. I was just discovering that with Doris. Of course, you know how it began, in wantonness as a kind of joke, thinking only of what I could get out of her, which was simply a kind of intoxication. It only changed after she tried to kill herself. Suddenly, I saw her as a real person. A real person whom I'd treated as, as a thing and very nearly destroyed. All through the trial, I kept thinking of the time when one could go forward in that new relationship. But now... But if you accept the facts, if you will them... Yes. The pain doesn't seem to be quite so bad. Perhaps I could think of her for a change. She's coming again tomorrow. Ah. One human being saying goodbye to another human being. It has a value. It makes some kind of sense. Time's up, sir. Very well. Goodbye, Hutton. Goodbye, Libard. Your move, General. I said your move, General. Uh, oh, well. It's a quarter to two, Miss Spence. Don't you think you ought to toddle off to bed? I've told you I'm not going to bed. Not until after eight o'clock in the morning. When's Dr. Libard coming? All he said was that it'd be very late. He had an urgent case to attend to some miles away. I don't know why you ever sent for him. I don't need him. Well, your father wanted it, dear. He's worried about you. And now, Miss Spence, let me help you to bed, and then I'll bring you a nice glass of hot milk. Come along, dear. There's a good girl. Don't touch me. Surely you've done enough reading for tonight, all these encyclopedias. Oh, that's such small print. You'll ruin your eyes. What are you doing with that encyclopedia? Just improving my mind, that's all. Give it to me. You're trying to spy on me. Spy on you? You'd better be careful. I know your tricks. You're working with Dr. Libard. But, Miss Spence, Go my... away. Oh. <sighs> What's that? What is it, nurse? It's all right, General. That's Dr. Libard. I'll go and let him in. Janet. Mm. What is it, Father? I want you to promise me something. Oh? It depends what it is. No. Promise first. Well, I suppose I can trust you. Take a rest. Take a holiday. You haven't been away for months and months. I don't need you. I've got this damn woman here. Go away. Have a spree. I'll have a spree. And damn the expense. None of your Swiss pensions, good hotels, decent restaurants. I'll give you the money, free as a bird. Start tomorrow, if you want to. Tomorrow? And pick up a husband while you're about it. If you don't mind, I'll go on reading my book. Come in, Doctor. Good evening, Janet. Good evening. Oughtn't you to be in bed by this time, General? Oh, didn't want to leave the girl alone. She's ill. Ought to have a complete change. You're right. I'll see what I can do. Nurse, I, I think you'd better take the general to his room. Very well, Doctor. Don't let it get you down, my girl. And afterwards, remember, a good spree. Good night, Doctor. Good night. You understand, nurse? Yes, Dr. Lever. Now, come along. Don't get to the bed. What does she understand? I thought perhaps you might like something later on to make you sleep. I've told Nurse Braddock what to do. Doctor's orders. Oh, just a friendly suggestion. <laughs> Why not? I should only stay up for things of importance. I'll just see that Father's all right. Good. Now for it. It's nearly two. Move the hands on an hour. Two minutes to three. And now my watch, in case I forget. Yes, that's it. Yes. 
Well, we'll see. Still here. I hope to be gone. I don't know what you ever came for. Well, it's a pretty unpleasant occasion. I thought perhaps... Uh... Five hours more. Do people ever die of fear? I suppose it could happen. Of course, the heart would have to be in pretty bad shape. These idiotic encyclopedias, they never tell one the things one really wants to know. Such as? When a man's hanged, how long does it take before he's dead? Well, it depends. If you just put a noose around his neck and let him strangle under his own weight, he mightn't die for five or ten minutes. Five or ten minutes? Nowadays, of course, they don't do it like that. They let the man drop eight or ten feet before the rope tightens. The shock breaks his neck. Do you think he deserves to die so easily? I don't think he deserves to die at all. I know why you said that, just to get me angry. It's part of your little scheme. What scheme? Trying to make me lose my head. Then I'll say things I don't mean to say. But this time, I'm not going to oblige. You could talk about him as much as you like. I shan't say anything. And I shan't go to sleep until I feel safe. Nearly five past three. It would still be possible to do it. To do what? To have the execution postponed. Why should it be postponed? If some entirely new fact were to turn up. Are you trying to get me to do what Doris wanted? I tell you, Emily didn't threaten to kill herself. She did, but I don't think she carried out the threat. No, of course not. She was killed. But not by Hutton. They proved it. The jury thought that they proved it. But do you think it over, Janet? Think it over. Mythical bird. Mythical bird. Mm. What's your trouble? Mythical bird. Seven letters begins with P. Begins with a P? Mm. What about Phoenix? P-H-O-E-N-I-X. Phoenix. That's it? Incidentally, it rose from the dead, if that's of any interest to you. Mm. I came across something in this book... Something extraordinary. Do you mind if I read it out to you? No, no, no. Go ahead. The difference between a good man and a bad man does not lie in this, that the one wills that which is good and the other does not, but solely in this, that the one concurs with the living, inspiring spirit of God within him, and the other resists it and can be chargeable with evil only because he resists it. <laughs> You're too deep for me. Deep? Yes. But clear. Crystal clear. Don't you see what a lot of things it explains? Oh, yes. How are your uh, hands? Still a bit sore. But there won't be any more hammering on doors. Not now. And by the way, I... I'd like to thank you for being as gentle with me as you were. I'm... Uh... Sorry if I ever had to be rough or anything. It was all in the course of duty, you understand? Well, it was nothing to what I've done in the course of not doing my duty. That's why I'm here, I suppose. For resisting the spirit of God within me. Life has to be lived forwards. But it can only be understood backwards. I suppose that's why we always make the important discoveries too late. Go right in, Matt. Don't pay any attention to us. Just carry on as if we weren't here. Game of cards, Bill. Oh, I don't mind. Doris, my dear. Oh, Henry. Henry. Darling, don't. I'm sorry. Oh, your poor hands. Yes, I, I treated them pretty badly, didn't I? Sit down there, darling. Must have been lovely in the country. Have the leaves begun to turn yet? Yes. Everything's brown and red and golden. I remember when I was a little boy in the beech woods at Arundel, walking in the dry leaves. I used to pretend to myself that it was money, knee deep in gold, like Aladdin. There's a theory nowadays that you oughtn't to bring up children on fairy stories. Don't let them talk you into any of that nonsense. Promise. I promise. 
If it's Belinda, she'll probably prefer Hans Anderson to anything else. Personally, I always found him a bit too sad and sentimental. If Patrick's like me, he'll like the Arabian Nights. That and the Rose and the Ring. How I loved the Rose and the Ring. My father used to read it aloud to me about six times a year. I'm afraid that'll be your job. I wish I were dead. I wish I'd never been born. What's the good of wishing? We have been born. And if one comes here, one's got to be prepared to go away again. Oh, darling, you mustn't grieve. You mustn't. I tell you, everything's all right. Even my being here. Even... Even our having to say goodbye to one another. Yes, ultimately, even that's all right. I know it is. And you can know it, too. I can't. I thought I couldn't. Until two days ago. Did... Did Libard tell you he'd been to see me? Yes. He helped me. He helped me a great deal. All the same, after he'd gone, oh, it was bad again. It was like having a, a terrible physical pain. And it's so excruciating that you can't think of anything else. It's the only reality. And then, all at once, the pain stops. And for the first time since it started, you see that there's a sun in the sky. You realize that those shadows out there are real people. You discover that your own wretched body isn't the whole world. There's all the rest of the universe. Do you love me, Doris? Darling. And you believe that I love you? I know you do. I know you do. I'm winning. <laughs> I'm winning. Look, a king. Perhaps that's the end you've done for me. <laughs> I owe you ten million pounds. Eleven million. Eleven, is it? Mm, heaven help me. <laughs> it looks like rain. I like rain. I like it when it rains really hard. And the thunder and lightning. Oh, God. That girl. That girl. Oh, it's too horrible. Like animals. I hate him. I hate him. Do you know what the time is? It's two minutes to eight. Only two more minutes. That's all. Two minutes. Then you'll be safe. I'll be safe. You must have got everything ready on the scaffold. The rope, the straps. And there's the governor of the prison and the chaplain. They're walking along the corridor. It isn't far, just a few steps. They're at the door. Somebody puts a key in the lock and turns it. The door opens. And there he is. Just because she was 22. Because of her mouth. Because of her skin. <laughs> oh, God! 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 Lie back in your chair. It's all right. You can go to sleep now. You feel safe now, don't you? Safe. Nurse. Nurse. I'm here, Doctor. I've got the injection ready. Good. Roll up her sleeve, will you? Yes, Doctor. Mm. Uh, syringe, please. Now, hold your arm quite still, Janet. This won't hurt. There. Now lie back and relax. Feel all right? Yes. Thank you. Tell me, Janet. How did you get her to take the poison? I put it in her coffee. You thought he'd ask you to marry him? Yes. No. You thought he loved you as much as you loved him? It was too awful. Too humiliating. Well, 
She, she's off. Now, nurse, get that number for me. Right, doctor. May I have that call for Dr. Libard, please? The Whitehall one. Yes, I'll hold on. Oh, by the way, what is the right time? The exact time? I must put my watch back. Uh, five past seven, Doctor. Uh. Oh, thank you. You're through now, Doctor. Thank you. Hello? I want to speak to the Home Secretary. Yes, it's Dr. James Libard speaking. He's expecting me to call him before 7.30. Yes, that's right. Connected with the Hutton case. Extremely urgent. Thank you. I'll wait. In The Jaconda Smile by Aldous Huxley, adapted for radio by Cynthia Pugh, the part of Henry Hutton was played by Noel Johnson. Janet Spence by Nicolette Bernard, Nurse Braddock, Maddie Head, Doris Mead, Deborah Dallas, General Spence, Austin Trevor, Dr. Libard, Godfrey Kenton, Clara the Maid, Jane Knowles, and the warder, Sean Arnold. The play was produced by Norman Wright. Aspiration, one of Mendelssohn's songs without words, played by Clive Lithgow. <laughs>